Judges chapter 16 and 7th book of the Old Testament. And today's passage contains one of the most, uh, perhaps one of the most well-known stories in all of Scripture. The story of Samson and Delilah. It's captured the attention of, and the imagination, I should say, of many composers, poets, songwriters, Hollywood scripts. I mean, you imagine there, there have been, there's been so much that has been written about Samson and Delilah. All these songs and poems and such. It is certainly a, a steamy story about a seductive temptress who uses sex for money, and an Israelite judge who uses women for pleasure. It's a story that's just as relevant today as it was when it was written. But as we've noted time and time again, the story of Samson is not merely the story of Samson. It's a picture of Israel. And we've noticed this, noted this tale of two Samsons as we have studied the story of Samson. And last time we left off, you'll recall that in chapters 14 to 15, we highlighted, though highly scrutinized, that Samson really is an example of what Israel was to be to the nations. And I noted that, that one of the things that we see and I emphasized is that you see the work of the Holy Spirit is very active in the life of Samson in those previous two chapters. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But I think even to, to nail this down, that what we see here is that at the end of chapter 15, that what we see is that the writer as if we needed something to, to contrast the two Samsons, what the writer does is he puts in a, a wedge in verse number 20 by telling us that he judged Israel some 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And so what we see in the previous chapters is the spirit at work in the life of Samson. It, it's clear, going back to the beginning of the story where the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife, and it was very clear from the very beginning that, that God was going to use Samson, that he had raised him up for this purpose of beginning to save Israel from the Philistines. They had become very comfortable in living with the Philistines. They had embraced their culture. And God, in his grace, raised up Samson. At the end of that first chapter of the story of Samson, you'll recall that it says that the, that the Spirit began to stir Samson. So he's provoking the people of the, the Philistines, the Philistia there, if you will. But then you see a, a totally different Samson in this chapter. It's a, it's a dark Samson, if you will. Interesting, we haven't talked much about this and didn't plan on talking about it, but Samson, which could be translated son, S-U-N. And there's so much in that that's in the story, but, but simply to highlight that instead of giving light, he becomes dark. We see this darker side of Samson in chapter number 16. That becomes very clear in those first few verses. Well, I'm going to read the chapter, and we'll make a few comments about it. Beginning in chapter 16, let me do this. Let me just change gears here for a moment. I love it. We're going to change gears here. I was going to read the first three verses. We'll pray, and then we'll read the second half of the story, Lord willing. Chapter 16, beginning in verse number 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her 
And when it was told to the Gazites, saying, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. And they kept silent all night, saying, let us wait until the morning light, then we will kill him. Now Samson lay until midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the city gate and the two posts, and pulled them up along with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain, which is opposite of Hebron. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, merciful God, we pray that you would be merciful to us today. Lord, that you would reveal our spiritual condition before you. Lord, we pray for a movement of your spirit in our midst. And Lord, that you would provoke us, stir us unto good works which you have prepared beforehand, even that we should walk in them. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to see ourselves in this passage, but also, Lord, that we would see the true and living God. All this we ask for the glory of your Son. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, these first three verses, here's what I want to do this morning. is I, I want to, as you look at this chapter, there's a lot of different ways that we could approach this. And certainly, there's much that we could say as an example of how not to live to the glory of God. I'm just taking out sections of my message as we speak. Well, there's so much in this. I mean, it's so rich. There's a lot that we could say. There's, there's so much that has to do, and this is certainly prevalent today when you think about sexual sin that is prevalent not only in the world but in the church there is much that we could say in this passage about that. I mean, there, there, this, this passage is one that we could spend weeks in really delving into. But I, what I'd like to do this morning is just kind of give us a broader picture, of a, a, a broader overview of the passage. And so I, I'd like to do this, uh, if we have time. I want to go through these first three verses, really just kind of highlight a, a truth that I see in this and then a truth that we see in the latter part of this section. And then I, I want to give you three, four, five takeaways from the story of Samson. And so, as you look at those first three verses, what I, what I want us to note, first of all, is that what we see in this is you see really, I, I think what we see is that God's power in the presence of his grace. And, and I say in the presence of his grace because Samson is unfaithful. He's an unfaithful servant of the Lord, and yet we see by the grace of God the power of God still at work in the midst of this. Samson, you'll recall, had stirred up the people. He had upset the people. And what you see this scene here, and we noted that the two Samsons, that when we see the scene here, it, it's purposeful that all of this is really following what has already taken place, taken place previously. And that is that Samson had devastated the economy of the Philistines. Philistia was upset. Now, Samson, as the story is revealed, Samson goes to Gaza. It's an ugly scene, and I, I, I'm going to be careful with the language this morning, but, but you can see it for what it says, that he went and he slept with a harlot. What's going on here? What, 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 is, what are we to take away from this? I mean, why this story of Samson? Why do we need to see this? And, and I would just have you to note that one of the things that as we're walking through the book that we see over and over is you see this pattern that God delivers a, a, a people. You see he raises up a deliverer, and then he, he closes out a section with how many years that judge had, had ruled for, and then he begins a new section. And over and over we've noted this, that Israel plays the harlot over and over again. And I say that to say that this wedge that's between the two Samsons also shows us something that literally, as a literary device, what we've seen over and over is that 
Samson, who represents Israel, is doing just what Israel did. That is that he is playing the harlot. He goes downtown to sleep with a harlot. And that's exactly what Israel had done. And I say exactly because the Scripture often depicts Israel chasing or pursuing after the gods of this world. One of the ways it does that is by using a whore or a prostitute. I know this is very strong language, but understand that if it is offensive to you, how much more is this offensive to God? And Samson represents Israel. Samson represents God's people who have said to God, God, you're not enough, and I need to go to the world to find something, someone that will satisfy this pleasure that I have. So Samson's depicted in this way. He goes to Gaza. What's so significant about Gaza? Well, this is a strong city, but it's the capital of Philistia. I mean, think about how bold this is that he goes to Gaza. Goes to Gaza. I mean, he has devastated their economy. He's, he's killed over a thousand men. You recall the story where he set the Foxes are probably better translated jackals. Loose tied the tails together of 150. He sends them out. 300 of them. Sends them out to 150 to burn the, the grain fields, the olive groves, the vineyards. I mean, everybody's looking for this guy. Where does he go? He goes right into Gaza. Right into the capital. Again, what's going on here? I mean, why is this? It certainly, it depicts Samson's boldness, but I also think it depicts Israel's boldness. That they're very open about their sin. They're, they have become comfortable in their sin. They've, they've become so comfortable that they've acclimated to the culture. In fact, go back to chapter 15 for just a moment. And notice that Judah, in verse number 9, of chapter 15, where they had come to see Samson. You remember, the Philistines had, had come, and they camped in Judah, and they spread out in Lehi. Lehi. And, and the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? They're asking the Philistines this. And they said, we have come up to bind Samson in order to do to him as he did to us. And so 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom, and said to Samson, do you know that the Philistines are rulers over us? I mean, what, what a sad state. What a sad commentary that the people of Judah, which is this strong tribe, what a sad commentary that they have become so comfortable in living in the culture that they have accepted that the Philistines would rule over them rather than serve the true and living God. It's a very sad commentary on their state. And if we look at Samson in, in like manner, there's a boldness in the way that he goes right into Gaza and sleeps with this harlot. Going back to chapter 16, you'll notice there in verse number 2 that he had slept with her half the night up until midnight and those who were waiting in late or those who were waiting for him laying in wait I should say they were waiting until the morning and they wanted to kill him that was their desire and Samson lays until midnight and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the city and the gate and the two posts and pulled them up along with the bars I mean what a scene I mean this is a man but it's more than a man. This is the spirit of God at work. This is the power of God. And I want to say that it's the grace of God, but in, in that the power of God is at work in the presence of his grace because God is committed to his people. He's made a, a promise, even going back to what we had seen earlier, is that He's going to begin to deliver his people. And so even though his servant has become unfaithful, even though his servant is following and pursuing 
the things of the world. God is still at work. The power of God is still at work. And, and I just want to make this point because we need to be mindful of this. Because sometimes we look and we, we see other churches that seem to have went away and they seem to be lacking. And sometimes there are even preachers who are in sin, living in sin, and, and really promoting sin in the sense that they're not preaching the truth of God's Word. But this is a reminder that God's faithfulness, that God's power is not limited by the faithfulness of men. That even, as they used to say, that God can still draw a straight line with a crooked stick. That when the power of the gospel goes forth, it still can save. And this is a reminder that even though Samson, his servant, is unfaithful, God is still faithful. And God is at work, and the power of God is at work in the midst of this. I find that quite encouraging. But as you see these two stories, it's not just that he picks up one story and picks up another just to show us how Samson, how far down he has gotten, but rather there's a, a parallel between the two. And I want us to pick up in verse number four and begin to read the story of Samson and Delilah. We'll try to make some comments along the way. Verse 4 says that after this, it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sori, whose name was Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him and see where his great strength lies and how we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. Then we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. A couple of things about Delilah that I would note here, and that is that we're not told exactly. There's some, among scholars, there's some question about what her name really means. And I bring that out to say there's also a question about her origin. That is to say, was she a Philistine? In fact, the text does not say that she was a Philistine. And it may be, and, and we won't take the time to go through this, but I would just have you to note that the binding that there's a lot of parallels between the way that she is described, what she does to Samson, and what we see in the previous chapter with what Judah does to Samson and binding him, that they are very similar. And I think the writer is doing this on purpose. It may be because of where she lived, which is in Sork, which was a, a region of Judah, it may be that she indeed was a Judite. It could have been. Does it matter whether or not she was a Judah? Well, certainly it speaks of the betrayal, but I also think it speaks of why Samson may have been more trusting with her. Because as we've seen him previously with the Philistine woman, the, the, the Timna, we, 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 we saw that, that he did not trust her as much. In fact, he was in total control of that situation. He finally told her, gave in to her, but it's a whole different situation. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter because the, the bottom line is, is that though she may have been a Jew, though she may have been a Judite and an Israelite, her heart said that she was a Philistine. It doesn't label her as a prostitute or a harlot, which it does in the previous woman, but at the very heart, she is a prostitute. She sells him out for money. He wants to use her for sex and she uses sex for money. And don't make no mistake about it. This is a lot of money. The text says that it's 1,100 pieces of silver. But be clear about this, that it says that each one will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. In other words, there were five overseers. There were five uh, powers to be there in Philistia. So this is 5,500 pieces of silver. This is a lot. She sells out. And then you see this back and forth, beginning in verse number 6. So Delilah, she, she, the motive is there. She's going to 
and get some money out of this. Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength is and how you may be bound to afflict you. By the way, this word afflict, and you're going to see it come up over and over, it's often used in the stories of Israel when they were in bondage to Egypt. I think there's parallels there, but notice what she says. Tell me where your great strength is. And Samson seems to toy with her. If they bind me with seven fresh cords that have not been dried, then I will become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords, again, of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh cords. There were five of these lords that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had, now watch this, verse 11, she had men lying in wait in an inner room. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the cords as a string of toe snaps when it touches fire, so his strength was not discovered. Now I want to be clear about what the text says. They were in the inner room waiting. Because one of the questions I had as I was going through the story the first time when I first read it, was if these guys are coming out and pouncing on him every time, I mean, I mean, come on, Samson, what are you doing? But if you read the text, it's very clear that they do not expose themselves. In other words, they, they are concealed. They're hidden in that inner room. It's not until the end that they actually come out. And so each time when he snaps them, and there were three occasions in this, what you see is that they do not come out. But I would say that what we see with Samson here is he's going back and forth with Delilah, and you're asking, what are you doing, man? That Samson is like us in the sense that he is dabbling with sin. He's toying with her. And sometimes we think that we can dabble in sin, and we can, we can just look or even taste of the things of the world and not be seduced by the world. And, and I want to say that we need to stay as far away from the world as we can. That we need to guard ourselves. We need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our minds. And, and some people may think that you are, you know, you are just, you're, you're too far. You're, you, you, you've, you know, you, you go way too far with this. You're too extreme with this. But I want to say that we cannot be too extreme when it comes to sin. We cannot be too extreme when it comes to guarding our hearts and guarding our lives. Samson seems to be foolish in his behavior. Looking back at the previous section where it talks about the wall, as he comes, he takes the, the door of the city and he uh, travels and takes it up on the top of a mountain that the that the city there is exposed. It reminds me of what the writer of Proverbs tells us, that, that a man without self-control, who unable to control his spirit, is, is like a city without walls. Open and vulnerable to the enemy. Delilah comes at him again. Notice, he says in verse number 10 that she says, Behold, you have deceived me and, and told me lies. Now please tell me how you may be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me tightly with new ropes, which have not been used, then I will become weak and be like any other man. And so Delilah took new ropes and, and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson, for the men were lying in wait in the inner room. But he snapped the ropes from his arms like a thread. Again, the same scenario plays out. Then Delilah said to Samson, Up to now you have deceived me and told me lies. Tell me how you may be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my hair with the web and fasten it with a pen, and I will become weak and be like any other man. He's toying to the point where he's right there about to talk. He's talking about his hair. 
But that's not the secret of Samson's strength. It was not in his hair. We know where the strength is, and even Samson knows. But verse 14 says, So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into the web. And she fastened it with a pen and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the pen of the loom and the web. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me with these three times and have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his, listen to this, his soul was annoyed to death. I mean, she just kept on and on and on and on. To the point where he couldn't take it anymore. Verse 17, so he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head. This brings to mind that he was a Nazarite, that he was set apart even before he was born. That He says, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I am shaved, then my strength will lead me and I will become Weak and be like any other man. And notice the difference that when Delilah saw that he had told her all that was in his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all that is in his heart. And so the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands, ready to make the exchange. Verse 19 is somewhat ambiguous language. And keeping in mind it's a Sunday morning audience, I will say this, that she made him sleep on her knees is actually language for sexual intimacy. Don't miss what is taking place here. In fact, this also somewhat strange the way it's worded that he and called for a man and had him to shave off the seven locks of his hair. Actually, the Hebrew is closer that she called for a man, and his head was shaved. It seems to be, and I think this is probably a more accurate rendering, that while Samson, after they had had relations, that that he has fallen asleep there on her, that he is exhausted, and that she is saying, Samson, It's not that she's calling for a man to come in and shave his head, but she is the one who says, Samson. And realizing that he is asleep and there in her arms, she shaves his head. And I think we should be clear, as verse 19 goes on to say, that she had shaved off the seven locks of his hair. There's a, a repetition of the seven we see over and over. What are we to make of that? And certainly as you think about the book of Revelation and you think about other references to the Holy Spirit, you see the sevenfold Spirit, which speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit. That it wasn't that his strength was in his hair, but his strength was in the Lord, but it was the Spirit of the Lord who was upon him. And what we see here is that the, that the hair is actually just an outward sign of what God was doing behind the scenes, that the true strength comes from the Lord. But God, in his grace, as she begins to afflict him, that his strength left him, that, that this visible sign that was his hair, meaning that he was dedicated or consecrated to the Lord, that it is now... Re- having been removed, that the Spirit of God is removed. But we should not think this is something magical. That is just because of his hair. His strength was not in the hair, it was in the Spirit. And the Scripture is very clear to show that the Spirit was very active in the work of Samson. In fact, when you look at the Judges throughout uh, the book of Judges, you'll notice that there are seven references to the work of the Holy Spirit. In each of those other references, you see the Spirit is at work one time in each of those. For example, we saw with Gideon, we saw the Spirit of 
the Lord at work in Gideon. And there are three prior references. There are seven references to the Holy Spirit in the book of Judges. Again, pointing to the sevenfold work of the Spirit. But out of the seven that are mentioned, the fourth is the Spirit stirring Samson that is listed there in chapter 13. And then the other three references, five, six, and seven, are in chapter 14 and chapter 15. That means that four times out of the seven that you see the work of the Holy Spirit in the judges is in the life of Samson. So this, this strength that we see, this power that we see, is not Samson. It is the Spirit of God that is at work. And yet, what we see here is I would note that now that the Spirit has departed from Samson, that the Philistines actually think that they had defeated him. In fact, she said, verse number 20, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Notice Samson's response in verse 20, that he awoke from his sleep and said, I, not, not God, not the Lord. He said, I will go out as at other times, and shake myself free. I mean, Samson had become so deep in sin, he had become so depraved in this that he was blind. In fact, we're going to see in a moment that he becomes literally blind as his eyes are removed. But spiritually, he's already blind. Do you see that? He's not even recognizing. I, we've been going through Second Peter on Wednesday night, and it talks about this being short-sighted or are blind that if we're not continuing in, in the knowledge of Christ, that we too are susceptible to becoming blind, that we can fall into sin, fall prey to sin, and become spiritually short-sighted and to the point where we're not even sure if we're saved. For Samson, he moves to this place of depravity. I mean, he, he is, it, it's so deep that he did not even know that the Lord had departed from him, is what verse 20 said. What, what a sad commentary to be a servant of God and not even know that the Spirit of God has departed from you. Verse 21, what takes place physically is what has already taken place, and that is that the Philistines had seized him. And they gouged out his eyes, and they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze chains, and he was a grinder in the prison. There's a play on words here. And the play on words is that he, again, using this euphemism of sleeping or as sleeping on her knees or as Job uses the similar kind of language to speak about having a covenant with his eyes, and that, that if I look upon another woman, he says, I think it's Job 37, or 34, 37, I think it is, but Job speaks about that if I look upon a, 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 another woman, that may my wife grind for another. And the play is this, that it's if God has said to Samson, that in all of this grinding, that in all of this activity, you, wanna, you want to be... This is what you want to do with your life. He gives him over to grinding, not for women, but certainly for these false gods. You know, that's the thing about sin is that we think we can dabble in sin, and next thing we know, that, that it is sin that has seized us, and it is sin that has oppressed us, and it is sin that we become enslaved to. And the very thing that we enjoy becomes the very thing that oppresses us. It becomes the very thing that we can't get rid of and we desire to get rid of. And for Samson here, there's a glimmer of hope. And we see that in verse number 22. Why else would the writer put this here? Again, he, he's making the parallel, the correlation of the the hair and the spirit, it's an outward sign, just like baptism is an outward sign. He says, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. 
And what you begin to see is God's grace in the absence of his power. God is at work still in the life of Samson. And it says that the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon. Dagon there, God, and, and to rejoice, for they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Is that, does that really just kind of, that just tees me off when I, when I read that. I mean, that, that, that really fires me up to, when the enemy wants to celebrate and worship their false gods, and that's what the Philistines are doing. They, because, see, this story is more than just a story about Samson. It's more than just a story about Israel. It's a story about God and the false god Dagon of this world. But notice what happens. It says that our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has given our enemy into our hands. And even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. And it so happened when they were in high spirits that they said, call for Samson that he may amuse us. Some translations say, they, call for Samson that he may entertain us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he entertained them. And they made him stand between the pillars. And then Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, let, let me fill the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. This is a, a place of worship. And Samson, who's blind, has a little boy lead him. And notice what he says in verse number 28. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were about 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking at while Samson was amusing them. In verse 28, then Samson called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O oh God, that I may at once be avenged to the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson has repented. He's looking to the Lord to give him strength. He's looking to the Lord in faith. And he grasped the two middle pillars, it says in verse 29, on which the house rested and braced himself against them. And the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down, took him, brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal, in the tomb of Manoah, his father, thus he judged Israel 20 years. So here we see God's grace in the absence of his power. Again, there's so much in this, but let me, let me just very quickly sum up some takeaways that we see, specifically in this last section, but all of the story of Samson. And, and the one thing that I would note is that we see with Samson that he start, started well, but then he fell in the middle. But then at the end, you see that he did repent and come back. In fact, he's listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as someone who had great faith. And it's a reminder of something that we were singing about early this morning, and that is, number one, a completed salvation. That is to say that God will finish this work he has began in his people. He is faithful to do so, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 tells us. In fact, as we've been studying in 2 Peter in chapter 1, that at the moment of our salvation, that is at the moment of faith, he has given us everything for eternal life and godliness at the very beginning. But then secondly, I, I would just have you to note the complete sovereignty of God that we see in this whole section. Again, it, it's not just the story of Samson. It's not just the story of Israel. But it is a story of God, of Yahweh, and this false God. Isn't it interesting in talking about the sovereignty of God that it's in the midst of 
Samuel, I mean, think about Samson, where he's at. He is there in this temple this, that, that's a, a place of worship, really, that's, that, that's given to their god Dagon. It's Colosseum, if you will, devoted to their false god. And of all places, this is where Samson cries out to God. I was thinking some time ago, I heard the story of a pastor there. who He pastors in Columbus, and he was given his testimony. And, and it, it was quite interesting because as he shared his testimony, he said that there was this young boy, he was in high school, who would come to him and share his faith. I say he would come to him. He was scared to death of him. The pastor, while he was in high school, was somewhat of a roughin'. He was somewhat of a bully. And this really young, wiry kid who looked like a, a, a weakling came up to him and shared the gospel with him. He did it not at school. He came to his door, knocked on his door. And essentially, this pastor was saying that all he could really get out was, you know, whatever you may be going through, I don't know what you're going, this is what this young boy was telling this man who later would become a pastor, he said, whatever you're going through, Jesus is the answer. Jesus can save you. And as this pastor told the story, he was like, yeah, and he shut the door, and the kid went off. <clears throat> Didn't think much about it. After he graduated from high school, he, he, was, he and a friend went to, if you're familiar with Columbus, it's a very rough area. He went, they went to this place where he, it was actually a motel with a prostitute. This is the man who becomes a pastor, but he had went there. He was unsaved. He was right out of high school, and he went, was there with this prostitute. He didn't realize that, that someone was in the room next to him, came in there and stabbed him while he was in this room with this prostitute. He ran, and, and he was bleeding as he was running away, and and all he could think, he, he and a friend were there, but all he could think as he was running away is that I'm going to die. And he, he dropped and he fell to the ground and he's bleeding out. And in that moment as he's bleeding out, he remembered what that little kid had told him. So no matter what you've done or where you're at, that Jesus is the answer. And he said he, he cried out, and asked Jesus to save him. And he said he did. That God saved him in that moment. He said, you know, he thought about this later. He said, if any, he said I, I got to think that if I had died in that moment, he said, I know that I was saved. You know, God saved me. I cried out. Best as I knew how, I repented of my sin, turned to the Lord in faith. He said, I got to think that if, if a pastor stood up to preach the funeral, he would have said, based on where I was, what I was doing, that this person is lost. It's a reminder that we don't know the condition of man, that we, we have a responsibility to tell them they're saved, but I can't tell you whether or not you're saved. Only the Spirit of God can do that. I can tell you how to be. And for me to make a judgment that you're not saved, that's not my place. But of all places, he's there with this prostitute. Of all places, Samson is there in this place of worship for Dagon. And I'm saying no matter where you are, that you can cry out to faith in God. And he will hear. That he is complete, completely sovereign. He's a complete savior. Certainly, Samson was used of the Lord to begin to save his people and deliver his people. But ultimately, the only one that can truly deliver us from every sin, from every evil deed, the only one that can save us ultimately wholly is Christ himself. And Samson is a picture of that. We noted that last time, that there, there are shadows, that there are glimpses that we see. And even in his death, we see that. That Samson was not on a suicide mission, that Samson sacrificed, that is, that he laid down his life, and that in his death, just like in the death of Jesus, many were saved. Well, there's much more that we can say in this, but I, I, I would 
close with this last thought, and that is another lesson that we can learn from this is complete surrender. The story begins in this chapter 16 by telling us how far Israel had gone, and they had they began to dabble in the things of the world, as depicted in Samson. They began to prostitute themselves. But our God deserves all of our devotion, not a part of it. We don't have to guess how God feels about friendship with the world. I mean, James chapter 4 makes it clear that it is considered adultery. That friendship with the world is hostility towards God. That we make ourselves enemies of God by, by pursuing this world. What God requires of us is everything. Everything. And what is he deserves from us is everything. Yesterday we closed out. We were with our grandchildren and watching Lila Rose, who's getting ready to be 12 now, play a ball game. She was playing soccer, and the team was down two to one. And it was getting close to the end of the game. I mean, there was just a, a few minutes left, and, and, I, and all the parents on the sideline began to, to stand up, and they were, they were telling the, the children these girls that were playing soccer, that the time was short. And as I was, as I was hearing, I, I could not help but to think about what it is that the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us today, that the time is short. We don't, we don't, we're not promised tomorrow. Even as I think about Delilah, where she's, she's posing this question about where your strength comes in. It's almost as if I can hear the Spirit of God behind Delilah reminding Samson where his strength comes from. And as those parents were standing on the sideline and they were saying, give it everything you got. It's almost over. Give everything you got. And I would say the same to us. Give everything you have. We're not promised tomorrow. And some of us, we're, 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 we're close. I mean, we're, we are close. And, and now is not the time to coast. Now is not the time to rest. Now is the time to be like that scrawny little boy who'd come and knocked on the door and said, let me tell you about Jesus. Now's the time. Now's the time, church. Wake up. Because the time is short. And our God deserves everything. Will you stand with me for prayer? <clears throat> Father in heaven, when we think about your love for your people, and that you have withheld nothing from us. That you didn't even spare your only begotten son. Oh Lord, forgive us for holding back. Forgive us for pursuing and dabbling in the things of this world. Oh Lord, would you cause us to be mindful of the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus has made on our behalf. And would you help us and enable us by your grace to live in light of his sacrifice. That indeed as we consider our calling. That we would walk in a manner that is worthy of that calling. Lord use us and help us. And grant us the grace and the power that we need to persevere to the end. This we ask that you might be glorified in our life and in the life of this church, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen.